Hey, this is Amber Castillo. Today we're doing something a little different, resharing one of our favorite episodes from 2023. This episode, originally published on May 2nd, focused on why kids need drag story hour. Since then, it's been nominated for multiple awards, featured on the Laura Flanders show highlighted on Apple Podcasts, and has reached hundreds of our neighbors across the city. The episode starts with some words from Flame, a drag performer based in New York City. Let's jump right in. I think it's so important to teach children self-acceptance, self-love, and also teach children to love each other and respect each other despite their differences. So yeah, it's really, really important for me to continue the work that we do with Drag Story Hours. Good morning. This is Epicenter NYC. We connect our communities to news, information, and each other. I'm Sam Zacker. I'm a reporter and podcast producer living in bed For months, I've been working on a story about the importance of Drag Story Hour in New York City. This episode is the first of a two-part series. For years, parents and kids across New York City have been going to Drag Story Hours. Its goal is to provide a safe space to promote reading, inclusion, and diversity. But as the events have become a target for hate, many supporters have another goal, to ensure Drag Story Hours continue to exist. You may have seen protesters outside of your local library, and you've probably seen headlines with anything from misinformation to bigoted lies about what goes on inside. I want to start with the basics. What exactly is Drag Story Hour? And why are kids and parents across the city packing rooms to participate? First, we're going to start off with a little activity. Can anybody guess how I'm dressed today? What I'm dressed like? Anybody have any idea? Uh, Looks like this. Yeah? Caterpillar! That's absolutely right. And do you know what happens to a caterpillar? Yes, that's right. Just like this. Now. So, you know what we're going to do now? Uh All of us together. Fly. Yeah, we're going to fly for sure. (laughs) We're going to first pretend. Do you like to pretend? Do you like to play pretend? Drag Story Hour performer Reverend Yolanda continues to lead attendees on an imaginary journey, one of a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. She teaches the kids about what caterpillars eat, and then they all spin into their own make-believe cocoon. The activity ends in a celebration. Something is transforming. Oh, what's happening? Oh. Wow! Oh my goodness! Have we all transformed into butterflies now? Yeah. I think we have. So, if you'd like to be a butterfly, let's just twirl our wings, and then we'll flap our wings. And magically, we have transformed from caterpillars to butterflies. Give us a As a founding storyteller, Reverend Yolanda has been leading drag story hours for years. This particular event took place at the Brooklyn Public Library last month. We spoke afterwards about how and why she got involved. Hi. <laughs> I'm Reverend Yolanda, and I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm trans femme gender queer. Uh, I'm a trans person who does drag, which is a little different than uh, a male person who does drag. And uh, that's why we actually changed our name from Drag Queen Story Hour to Drag Story Hour, because we have a lot of storytellers that uh, are many different genders, and we all like the art of drag. So from my perspective, um, drag is an art form, like painting and drawing and making music and everything else. So this is just one of the uh, tools, artistic tools in my bag, you know. So how did you get involved in Drag Story Hour starting reading? Well, actually, um, I was one of the founding storytellers here in New York City. Our former executive director, her name was Rachel, uh, was a friend of a friend of mine. 
so I reached out to Rachel and invited her to come to one of my shows. I am a, a, a legal ordained reverend, and I have a ministry with my husband. So everything that we do uh, is very kid-friendly and very, very um, lovely to attend. So um, we were doing one of our shows at um, a bar in the East Village, and Rachel came, and she really liked what I was doing. My shows are always usually full of energy and uh, a moment or two of, of insight, you know. Uh, so to me, this works very well because I get to um, I get to play, which is what I like to do with my uh, young friends. So. Like Reverend Yolanda, Flame, a drag performer based in New York City, has been involved in Drag Story Hour for many years. Part of the reason Flame started performing with Drag Story Hour was because they wished that they had a chance to attend events like this growing up. My name is Flame. I am a storyteller with Drag Story Hour. I use they, them pronouns. So how did you get involved in Drag Story Hour? I got involved with Drag Story Hour about five years ago uh, because a friend of mine told me about this then new program that was happening. She knew I was great with kids. She knew that I am a drag performer. And she thought it was a really good combination. I went in and I got it. So I've been working with them ever since. Uh, But more importantly is uh, why I got involved with Drag Story Hour is because I was a very self-aware queer child as early as toddler age, you know, two, three years old. And I came from a background where it was not so socially acceptable, a Latinx community, very young migrant parents with a very machismo attitude of what a boy should be. And yeah, I had a really hard time dealing with my own queerness. And I know for a fact that having a program like Drag Story Hour would have meant so much to me. And it was just really important for me to be that for the community, be the change that I wanted to see in life. Can you tell me a little bit about how you approach uh, your performances for Drag Story Hour, like what you decide to read and what you decide to do for them? Sure. Well, well, all the books from Drag Story Hour go through librarians and teachers, and we have a set of approved books. Um, we do have some books that are more LGBT-oriented, like Twas the Night Before Pride by Joanna McClintock, which was a children book written for a child audience, but explaining an adult theme, which is, you know, why Pride came to existence, but done in a very kid-friendly way. But yeah, all books are pre-approved beforehand to make sure that they are kid-friendly and appropriate. Um, I really love to read Neither by Early Anderson because for me, when I read the book, it's about a creature that is othered by their peers because they're not exactly like everyone else. And for me, I feel like that really resonated and relates to me as the way I grew up as a gender queer child, you know, as a little boy who liked to play with makeup and wear dresses. But that book has absolutely nothing to do with LGBT issues. And I speak about my own personal experiences of how I relate to that book. But of course, I let the audience decide and, you know, start a conversation of how they might relate to it. But basically, the book just speaks up against bullying, which I think is really important. Um, I also want to note that LGBT kids are four times more likely to attempt or want to attempt suicide because of rejection from home, from society. And those of us who make it to adulthood are four times more likely to experience violent hate crimes uh, and murder. So another big part of why I want to work with Drag Story Hour is because I think it's so important to teach children self-acceptance, self-love, and also teach children to love each other and respect each other despite their differences. So yeah, it's really, really important for me to continue the work that we do with Drag Story Hour. It's a shame that we have experienced so much backlash, which um, I don't want to talk too much about, but you know, it's a reality. And yeah, unfortunately, I feel like a lot of that comes from a place of ignorance. You know, people People project their own feelings and thoughts of what they think the program is without ever really considering to consult with someone actually involved with the program, which is why I'm really thankful for this opportunity to be speaking to you today. So yeah, thank you so much for conducting this interview and not focusing on the the drama and the bigotry and the hate that we've unfortunately been experiencing, which a lot of other media outlets seem to really want to focus on. But Really, we don't want to be dragged into an argument, uh, political or otherwise. We just want to exist uh, with dignity and just be allowed to be ourselves in our everyday life, whether it's our work or our school or just walking down the street. We just want to exist, you know? 
Thank you so much for sharing that with me. And besides the the books and the storytelling involved in Drag Story Hour, what other pieces? Are there like songs? Are there, I don't know, some sort of like call and response, things like that? First of all, um, I'll give you a little tour, virtual guided tour of what my story time looks like. But first, I really, I, I think it's really important to point out that Drag Story Hour storytellers come in all shapes and sizes. There seems to be uh, a misguided notion that it's all men in dresses. Some of us are men in dresses. Some of us are trans women in dresses. Some of us are trans men. Some of us are cis men. There, we have a cis woman who is a drag queen as well. Like we, we're just people. We're people in costume, in makeup, and we're, we're entertainers, you know? So I think that's super important to point out first and foremost. Uh, and with that said, typical story hour by moi consists of an introduction of to who I am and my pronouns. And I like to go around the audience and get to know my audience. I ask for everyone's names and pronouns. And then I get into my first book. After I do my first book, I do a song and dance activity. Then I do my second and usually third book, followed up by a Q&A. And usually I find that the older kids uh, and adults and seniors like more of the Q&A towards the end. For the little ones, we do a coloring activity, which is really fun, or just more song and dance. But yeah, the idea is just to uh, be there as my most authentic self. Uh, in a fun, colorful costume that, you know, people can uh, enjoy and just, yeah, just provide a fun time for the audience. You, you'll never get bored coming to one of our events. And yeah, what's wrong with showing a little bit of LGBT representation because we also exist and we matter and we're valid and kids need to see that so they don't grow up feeling so uh, alienated. Helping to make these events possible is Drag Story Hour Executive Director Yoon Hee Prophet. I spoke to Yoon Hee before a Drag Story Hour event at Brooklyn Public Library about why she got involved and why the events are so important for kids. Hi, I'm Yoon Hee. I'm the Executive Director of Drag Story Hour in New York City. So what do you enjoy about being involved in this organization? I think this organization, Drag Story Hour New York City in particular, helps to really harness the humanity of all its participants. And so we come in, we see people for who they are, for what they would like to see, what they would like to show, and the best way that they can offer themselves to others. And we also help people to find a voice if they feel they're lacking one. And we celebrate gender diversity, we build empathy, we celebrate self-acceptance for youth. And we do that through literacy, we do that through song and dance. Yeah. And what challenges are there involved in doing this, this work? There shouldn't be challenges. Right, but there are. Um, and those challenges really politicize Drag Story Hour, New York City, and what it stands for. So at the end of the day, we're a literacy and arts based organization. Having said that, because things have become so politicized, you know, we have had to pivot. So now we have to ensure safety of all our participants and all of our staff members and storytellers. And we do so in conjunction with many of our city based officials who have offered their support as well. But we also try to maintain the joy-filled aspect of the work that we do and that's um, what is most important to Drag Story Hour in New York City is to put on programming that youth can respond to, that they love to attend um, and that they feel resonates with them in some way. Like Yoon Hee, Lisa Goldstein, the manager of the Youth Wing at the Brooklyn Public Library, feels strongly about creating a safe space for kids to learn to accept themselves and others for who they are. She also mentioned this is one of their most popular programs. My name is Lisa Goldstein. I'm the manager of the Youth Wing at the Central Library for Brooklyn Public Library. Why did you guys start hosting Drag Story Hour here at Brooklyn Public Library? It happened about uh, over five years ago. They were starting um, to move. They started in the West Coast in San Francisco, and then they were starting to do them in bookstores. And a staff member, Kat Savage, who worked at another library at the time, had seen one and thought it would be a terrific uh, obviously a great program for libraries because we do so many story times here um, and so I think Kat hosted one and it went well because there was so much interest from the public so it already was a program that the public wanted and that's really important for us when we're planning or deciding to do programs um, the story time aspect was also obviously an easy sell it kind of evolved a little bit as they were reading longer books um, and we we actually ended up 
um, developing story time training for drag performers and put them through some training and help them select books. Um, basically, we did the kind of we have a story time 101 training for librarians, and we did the same. We did the same thing, except that because they're already the people there were already performers. They actually had. I mean, I feel like I learned a lot <laughs> from from being there, um, and we just kind of talked about ways to manage young children's attention, um, appropriate books and activities and great, so you know, good songs to use. Um, but it's definitely a program that people noticed um, just for the diversity, like the gender, just something that immediately puts it out there as a way of showing children what gender can be or what it doesn't have to be, leading to great discussions. We definitely had a lot of queer families coming. We'd see people coming out for this program. I mean, it was definitely a, a kind of a destination program. Um, and I think it's really liberating to just have this, something that a lot of people for bad reasons think is inappropriate, but it's actually incredibly appropriate to to show children who who aren't, aren't really trapped yet by gender roles themselves, like what you can continue to be as an adult. And yeah, it's very important. I spoke to a handful of parents who have brought their children to Drag Story Hour. They echoed what Lisa told me. The kids love it. Here's Laura Beth Lima and their nine-month-old Baldwin. They live in Jackson Heights and consider Drag Story Hour a place where they can feel a sense of pride and joy for their community. I have many intersectional cultures, and one of them happens to be being queer. And that's not something that I'm pushing on my child. That's just a fact of life. They have two queer parents, right? And so we want them, just like any heteronormative person, would just let their child be a part of their lives. <laughs> Baldwin is a part of our lives. Um, and so naturally, we want them to have pride and joy um, and feel a sense of celebration for the community that they're part of. So when I take Baldwin to Drag Story Hour with my wife, we just feel a sense of pride and joy to see our community, um, to see um, all the kids there and all the parents there who are just having a good time and listening to stories that feel inclusive, right? Sometimes programmatic um, opportunities can feel like we're navigating, you know, spaces and systems that aren't designed for us and don't include us. Like, are we going to be you know, misgendered in the space? Are we going to be discriminated in the space? But when we go to Drag Story Hour, we know that people are going to respect our pronouns and respect our families and not question our family making. And it's a safe space designed for us by us. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, so even though all that policing is going on outside, when we walk into that room, it's magic. And I just want more of that magic. And we will continue to fight for that magic. For parents like Laura, this is one of the very few accessible and safe spaces for them to celebrate the LGBTQ plus community with their kids. It's events like this where they don't have to worry about being misgendered or discriminated against. In our next episode, we'll hear from more parents and take a closer look at why it's so important for Drag Story Hour to continue to exist and why we all need to take action to save it. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. And thanks for supporting us as we do our best to support our community. We couldn't do it without you. For more storytelling like this, visit us at epicenter-nyc.com. And if you're not already a member, sign up today by using the link in our show notes. Our intro music is All the Pretty Horses by Kara Vika. You can find more of their music on their website linked to in our podcast description. 